Welcome back to the Payne's Creek Killings. It's time to investigate Bernard's house once again, now that we have a hammer to pull up the bloody floorboard, and we have what appears to be a key to one of the locked doors in here. Before I go upstairs to do that though, something I want to keep in mind and kind of look at for every location that I revisit is I'm still looking for this light on the wall that can be moved and it activates something, and I'm also looking for any typewriter to look at the typography of the E. I don't remember if Bernard had a typewriter. Yeah, this door's locked, right? Yeah, so that's probably what the key's for. No typewriter. Nothing to activate on the wall. Okay, let's pull up this bloody floor floorboard. Welp, there's a murder weapon. <laughs> Serrated blade, there's dried blood stains on it. Who was that used to kill, though? Either, I'm thinking it's either Scott or Andrew. Andrew was stabbed all over and their lungs collapsed. And the report specified that they seemed like small pocket knife cuts, right? Or was that Scott? Let's look at the report for Scott. Um... I could go to my notes, but actually we might as well just go to the newspaper article. Multiple stab wounds to the heart. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Lo motionless. They arrived. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it doesn't specify. It just says stab wounds. And there wasn't an autopsy for Scott, right? Andrew, Henry, and Vivian. Yes, yeah, the one for Andrew, that's the one that specifies that it was with a switchblade or a small knife. This is most certainly not that, so I don't think this could have been the murder weapon for Andrew. I mean, that's not a small knife, right? It's certainly not a pocket knife, and it's definitely not a small knife. It's actually quite large. So I guess it could have been Scott. But then if it was Bernard, why wasn't it Derek? It really, really strongly seemed like Derek was the one who did it. Don't know. Bernard's bedroom. Well, okay. Okay, we know Bernard was in love with Vivian, right? And I was thinking there was no way Bernard killed Vivian, but based on this, it looks like there's a good chance he might have. What happened that made him start hating Vivian? Did she rebuff him or something, or is it? Did, did Bernard learn that she was apparently sleeping with the banker? But why would that matter? I mean, he was she was already sleeping with Charles, you know, the person she was married to, right? I maybe we'll find out. Bernard's diary, January twelfth, nineteen ninety-five. I drove Vivian today since Derek is out of town with Charles. On the way, she expressed to me how, despite having a successful business, she felt empty. Trisha hates Vivian for trying to stop her from seeing Scott. She seemed to be really bothered by the name Vincent, and her relationship with Charles seems to be just for show. 
I wish I could comfort her during her troubled times. If only I could confess to Vivian how much I respect and... How, how much I respect and admiration I have for her. January 18th, 1995. Ever since Trisha brought up the topic on Vincent, Vivian has been pretty quiet. I can't remember the last time Vivian looked happy. Even during dinner, she hardly spoke. I don't think anyone can blame her. Wanda hasn't been coming to work for a while now. Her illness is getting worse. I wonder how she's coping. February 5th. Derek wasn't available to drive Vivian, so I offered my assistance again. It's been a month since I first drove her. She's opening up more and more to me, telling me the struggles she faced, her rocky relationship with Charles, and how she really disliked Scott. Sometimes, I would give her some suggestion when she asked what she should do. Other times, she just wants someone to listen to her. Most of the time, I'm happy to be with her. February 22nd. Vivian seemed rather distraught recently. During the afternoon tea gathering, I stood outside the room and listened through the door gap. She feels miserable being with Charles. They hardly look at each other, let alone speak. Personally, I don't think Charles deserves her. I finished reading Vivian's autobiography. Half the facts were incorrect. The writer should have done his homework better. Oh, that's right. The Yeah, there was the biography of Vivian that was downstairs on the table. The writer should have done his homework better. Bernard would know. He's Vivian's greatest fan. March 17th. Whenever I drove for Vivian, she would ask me to drop her off at the corner of the street in front of Tom's Cafe, then told me she would go back by herself. It aroused my curiosity. So after dropping her off, I parked the car and watched her. She ordered a cup of coffee to go. She then left the cafe and walked up the street for about five minutes to a residential area. She stopped in front of an apartment and pressed the doorbell. Shortly after, a man in his early 30s, wearing a suit, opened the door. He leaned over and hugged Vivian. She then gave the coffee to him and exchanged some words. I could not hear what they said. They then entered the building. Who is he? Okay, I think he was apparently jealous of the banker. I guess the reason he didn't consider it a big deal that Vivian was with Charles is because, as he said, their their relationship is most, mostly symbolic and kind of empty. So I guess she wasn't really with him in anything but name. I guess Bernard was angry that Vivian chose to take comfort in this other man instead of him. May 12th. This is the sixth time I'm following Vivian. After she went into the building with the guy, I parked the car nearby to wait for her to come out. Is this considered stalking? Yes. About two hours later, a car stopped in front of the apartment building. Shortly after, Vivian came out of the apartment building. The guy came out with her. They chatted for a bit. Vivian looked extremely comfortable with him. Before leaving, she kissed him on the cheek. What's going on? May 29th. I track down the guy. He works at a bank. The place they meet is his apartment. How could she do that? Who the hell is he? I reported sick for the third consecutive day. As I lay in bed staring at the ceiling, I kept thinking, why would Vivian be seeing another man? No matter what Charlie uh, did to her, she has kept her faith in him throughout the years. How could she be having an affair now? She's better than that. She's supposed to choose me. Yep, that was it. Okay. Hmm. There's something I was going to say. Oh, yeah, I reported sick for the third consecutive day. I would have to check the dates. But is that related to... Um, the alibis. Remember the alibis? Um, one of the other people working, I don't remember if it was Dorothy or the other person whose name I barely remember. Something Martinez, I think. Didn't they mention, um, like Bernard mentioned that he was sick and home and 
one or two other people that worked at the mansion mentioned that he seemed sick and went home. But he had to stay late that one night because no one else was working or something like that. I have to see if these dates line up. So if this I reported sick for the third consecutive day thing is just an excuse and he wasn't actually sick. That was just an excuse for his stalking. Well, this needs a note. Charles learned about Vivian's affair. Um... He hated her because of it, I think we can say reasonably. Murdered her? Wait, Charles. Bernard. No dartboard. The hell's up with that bathtub? Why does it look like someone rubbed charcoal all over it? Day one, the hospital gave me these pills. They're supposed to help fight depression. Day two, I feel a slight dizziness. It might be the food that I ate this morning. Day three, the dizziness comes and goes. I'm still able to work. Not a big problem. Day five, it's my day off today. I didn't take the medication. By the evening, I started thinking about Vivian. Day eight, I had to drive Vivian again, so I took double the dosage. I had a migraine for the rest of the day. At least I didn't have to think about Vivian. Day 11. Couldn't Vivian stop seeing that guy? Why can't I stop thinking about it? Day 11 again. Now I know that my dizziness comes from those pills. Day 20. The pills, they don't seem to work anymore. It doesn't matter if I take them or not. I can't stop imagining what Vivian and the guy are doing whenever they meet. Day 32. I stopped taking the medication. Well, depression and anxiety can definitely cause kind of obsessive thoughts like that, but it doesn't make anybody violent. So that is certainly not the reason he, what looks like, killed Vivian. Okay, I think that's it for Bernard's house. Alright, so where to next? At the moment, the only key I have to go anywhere else is Oliver's photography, and I think that's going to open up a lot of other things with the tools that I'm going to get there. But there is also some other stuff to follow up on, like I still need to look for that wall light. See where that is and see if I can open up some sort of a... something. I also need to look for typewriters, take pictures of them and see how the typography looks. That reminds me. I know I'm looking for a key in one of these storm drains. So, can I use the hammer to do that? Almost certainly not. No. <laughs> Makes the locked jiggling noise. I don't think that's what that would sound like. Aha! I found the light. It is in Matthew's office in the church. Right here. Look familiar? Huh. I'm guessing it opens this. There's something back here? I need a key. Maybe that's the key that was mentioned in that little fragment here. He's onto me and I need to... I need to... 
Or I had to hide the key in one of the drains by the roadside. Maybe that was written by Matthew. Okay, well. Let's amend this. In Matthew's office is a light that takes a key. The key in one of the roadside drains. Tag Matthew in that. I'm thinking the hammer also might be used to open the stuck drawer somewhere in the top of Wanda's house. Where was that? Over here? Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Now whose room is this again? So this is one. Yeah, the other one is Derek's. City of New Jersey, Department of Child Psychiatric Division. Psychiatric Evaluation of Derek Tyler. This is June 17th, 1981. Dear Miss Wanda Tyler, after almost five months of sessions, your son, Derek Tyler, is now much better. We are still unable to get him to talk much, but he has chosen to express his thoughts and feelings through written text, which is a breakthrough for him. During his last session, however, he wrote the following. Dad was standing in the middle of the road. He was waving to me. Mom was crying and her tears dripped onto my face. I woke up. Kitty was purring and licking my face. I think she wanted to go out. Mom doesn't like me to make noise when it's late at night, says it will wake everyone up, so I was very quiet when I opened the back door. Kitty flew away. There were noises behind the wall fence. There's a door that's always locked, but there's light behind the keyhole. I walked to the door and looked through the keyhole. There were four people. Two of them were fighting. A baby was crying. Then one of them fell down and hit her head. She stopped moving. Her eyes were opened. I wet my pants because she was looking at me. Derek has since been very quiet. We haven't been able to grasp fully if what he wrote was real or imaginary. Nevertheless, we are concerned with this situation. Kindly get back to us so we can discuss further steps to help him. Christ. So there was a fifth person there. With Sophia, when she was killed, Derek saw. Noises behind the wall fence. There's a door that's always locked, but there's light behind the keyhole. Well, that adds a new dimension to this. So Derek knew the whole time. So, Derek, when he was... Wait, how old was Derek? I actually have a note specifically for Derek's age, relative to Scott, when he was young. I'll check it in a second. Looked through a keyhole and saw Sophia's death. I wonder if that gives them a motive to frame Derek, because I keep thinking, you know, it looks like Derek did it, but then I'm not sure. I wonder if somebody framed Derek. So let's tag Derek and Sophia. Okay, so I have something in here for Derek's age. Derek is five years older than Scott and is protective of Trisha. Yeah, I made that a long time ago. So yeah, Scott was about five years old at the time. Very young. January 24th, 1981. The school called. The principal told me that the kids have been calling Derek names, saying that he's a bastard child. I know that Derek wants to know where his father is. I don't know what to say to him. February 20th. The school called me again and told me that Derek poked a bird nest till it fell off the tree. After that, he stoned the chicks to death. This resulted in him being suspended from school for a week. The principal asked if Derek had suffered any kind of trauma that may cause him to act like this. I could not tell him that Derek witnessed Sophia being killed. He was only five when that happened. May 11th. 
Derek stopped going to school. He told me school isn't for him. I should not have asked him to keep quiet about Sophia's death. He must have been bottling up his emotions all these years. Maybe it's time I start homeschooling him. I think it's time to head to Oliver's Photography. Here we go, Oliver's Photography. Oh, I'm excited. Tools. Oh, I can't wait to dig up that time capsule. It's been so long since I've gone to explore an entirely new building. Looks like Oliver took some photographs of local life. Why is this one made out of an entirely different material, and yet the same shape? How odd. Who stores a single book on a bookshelf like that, by the way? That's also very odd. exactly what to do with that. And I also know exactly what to do with that. Office of Church Haven, July 17th, 1995. Dear Mr. Oliver Gibson, we regret to hear that Father Matthew will not be joining the annual religious gathering event from July 18th till the 23rd. We received Father Matthew's memo yesterday stating that he was not feeling well. I assume he had also informed you about this last minute change as well. We wish him a swift recovery so he may serve the people of Payne's Creek soon. Huh. Okay, so this is interesting. So that means that Matthew was lying in his alibi. But this doesn't fit with what Stephen Moss said. Stephen Moss said he realized one of them was lying because the event they mentioned going to was canceled. But in this case, the event wasn't canceled. Father Matthew just made an excuse that he wasn't feeling well. So does that mean, Charles, that event also, the conference, also didn't happen? Or I wonder if that's just a little bit of a mistake they made writing it. Which wouldn't surprise me. Don't know, but I need to note that. So I just kind of amended this note. Stephen Moss thinks one of the events mentioned in the alibis is a lie because the event was cancelled. Later in Oliver's photography, it says Matthew didn't actually go, so he lied. But it wasn't because the event was cancelled, rather he made an excuse. Did Charles also lie then? January 3rd, 1996. We just attended Trisha's funeral this morning. Charles tried to be strong, but by the end of the ceremony, his face was wet. Dorothy cried her heart out. It pained me to witness so many deaths in Payne's Creek, all of whom I knew well, and some of them very close to me. Among them, Vivian's death shocked me the most. 
Despite what the media said, I will not for even a moment believe that Scott killed her. It just didn't make sense to me. Trisha's death hurt the most, probably because I spent the last few days mentoring her. She's a... Uh, a smart, kind, and very talent... She's... Wait, what? She's a smart, kind, and very talented, who just turned into a promising young woman. With her passing, Charles had lost all his family members. He's all alone. I can't imagine the pain he has to go through. August 14th. Dorothy left Payne's Creek early February, a month after Tricia passed away. The hospital closed shortly after. By the end of the month, Charles had packed and departed Payne's Creek for good. Wanda passed away on March 12, 1996. Her cancer had spread too far and too deep. The doctor could not save her. Two weeks after her funeral, Derek moved out of Payne's Creek. Autumn is approaching. My photography store will be closing by the end of this month. I have many things to say, but there's no one to confide to. Anyway, I've been thinking about... Um... About telling for... Anyways, I've been thinking about telling for quite a while now. Maybe the time has come. No dartboard. Let's go dig up that time capsule. January 30th, 1996. Scott is gone and Trisha is dead. How did this happen? We held Trisha's funeral last week. Not many people came. This village is almost barren. The young are gone and the old are dying. I will be leaving here soon. The night Vivian died, I saw Scott meeting her. I was at a distance from where they were arguing. I couldn't hear the details, but I could tell they were arguing. When Scott left and went back to his cabin, I followed him. I watched him through the window till early morning, all the time thinking how we have drifted so far. How could Trisha choose him over me? Am I not good enough for her? So this is from Derek. Definitely from Derek. The police questioned me when Scott was suspected of killing Vivian. I know he didn't do it, but I decided not to tell them what I know. With Scott locked up, I could have a chance to be with Trisha. I didn't expect that this small omission on my part would eventually lead to Scott's death. When Scott died, Trisha ended her life. In a way, I too died that day. I never wished for Scott to die, nor Trisha. I hope they can forgive me. Derek Tyler I didn't expect that this small omission on my part would eventually lead to Scott's death. So Derek did not kill Scott. Despite the whole argument the day before in the marketplace, and the pocket knife and everything. So I think it was Andrew, huh? Yeah, I've got all this circumstantial evidence on Derek, but I'm going to amend this. I was thinking, is either Derek or Bernard, because Bernard was with Charles when Charles mentioned... You know, that it'd be better if Scott was killed. And then Bernard drove him home. So is it Derek or Bernard? I'm going to say... So... It was Bernard. It does fit the evidence. I mean, we know that Scott died from being stabbed. It didn't specify that it was uh, with a small knife or anything like that, so that perfectly fits with the bloody knife found in Bernard's house. Well, there's the bishop, <laughs> but I don't need it.
Trisha, congratulations. I'll always love you. From Mom. Right, this was made in happier times, right? When Trisha, Scott, and Derek were all still friends, right? Secret of Pains Creek. Mansion, hidden room and study room. I already found it. Secret room above father's room. Hmm, well I haven't been able to get inside of the father's room. At least their bedroom. I mean, there is the office. Maybe that's what the key's for? Maybe it opens the secret room above? Above? The attic? Where he does all the woodworking, I think, if I remember right. Underground secret passage. Future Detective Scott. <laughs> Underground secret passage, where exactly is that? So that's at, like, where the road meets between the church and the mansion. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, I'm not really sure where that is, to be honest. I mean, that could be talking about the sewers. That's like here. But... Doesn't really look like it. I don't know. Like here? Not sure. Well, I guess I'll go take a look for it, and I've also got some drains to open. So I'll bring you back when I find something. Aha! Okay, I haven't necessarily found anything yet, but I think I just am about to. So I've opened up all the drains I could think of, and I didn't find anything. So I kept looking, looking, and looking in different areas for more drains that I'd missed, and I think I just found one. It's very, very well hidden. I'm betting there's something good in this one, because it's so hard to find. Uh-oh. Doesn't look good. Got a thin layer of floating leaves on top. No! Huh. Well, I wonder if there's more hidden under the leaves that I missed. Very possible. There's a lot of leaves on the side of the road. Yeah, so how I found this one, what kind of hinted me to it is I was thinking, does this sewer map, these little things here, I was thinking they pertained to these drains. And I'm not sure if they do or not. It's hard to tell because this sewer map doesn't exactly match the layout of the road up here. I mean, you can see they're quite different. Certainly similarities, but... Yeah, fairly different. But I just saw that there was one near the post office. And I remember that I hadn't found one, so that's what made me look near it. Maybe I should just count how many there are. So how many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Have I found six? Let me go count. Ah, I didn't get through finished counting, but look what I found. Another one covered by leaves. Still nothing, huh? Alright, well, back to counting and staring at leaves. Oh, I missed this one. It's totally uncovered, too. This is a pretty good candidate, because it is fairly near the church. Oh! I see a key! Oh my god, 
this is it, this is it, this is it. And by the way, I think this is the seventh, so I'm not sure if the sewer map really has anything to do with these drains. Key with the 19th century design. Fancy. All right, Matthew. Let's go take a look at your wood workshop or whatever it is. Mayhaps we'll find the murder weapon. So, secret room above father's room. So this must be father's room. Yeah, I thought we would end up getting into here and this would be his bedroom. And that's where it would be above, but nope, it's here. So yeah, if I remember right, the attic is supposed to be where Father Matthew did all his woodworking, I think. I'm kind of scared. Well, at least the lights work. Oh. I wonder if you can see this room from down there. I'm surprised the little tools there are for being a woodworking shop. Oh, Christ. <laughs> and there's a typewriter. A bloody axe and a typewriter. Well, I think that's going to confirm what we already pretty much know. maybe? Well, doesn't the E look... Gah! Ah! I was looking at the E and then I looked at what it actually said. Someone came to Payne's Creek. She cannot know. I was worried about that, because I remember the fresh flowers left by Matthew at Sophia's grave. I was thinking, well, Matthew must be in town, huh? I wonder if I'm going to even leave this place to report, huh? Don't know. I really want to close this door behind me, but it's not happening. <clears throat> hallucinating when we met, saying that he's seen Sophia everywhere, that he's a sinner, and that he should die. But I didn't mean to kill him. My hands are still shaking. June 30th, 1995. Dr. Johnson came. He was surprised to see me. He tried to justify, saying it wasn't his fault, that he was only carrying the baby and had nothing to do with Sophia's death. When I revealed the truth about Magdalene, his face turned white. He didn't expect anyone to know the truth. He deserved to die. July 19, 1995. Just like the doctor, Vivian came alone. Instead of feeling guilty, she called Sophia a bitch who destroyed everything she had. I didn't feel any sign of remorse, feeling of guilt, or repentance from her at all. So I gave her time to express herself. And then I killed her.
It's all over now. Why am I not at peace? There's this nosy investigator in town. I thought that if I led him to believe that Bernard killed Vivian, he just might believe it. But I made the mistake of trying to mislead him. Now he's suspecting me of being the killer. He has to die. You cannot save from now on. Okay. I did not expect that this game to have a section where you have to run away from Matthew. Oh fuck. Um there's a basement. There there there's a basement. Oh oh fuck. Thank you. Sophia's pointing to the basement. Okay. I <laughs> gotta go through the sewers now. Um, okay, well, I still got the health bar, so I'm thinking I'm still in trouble. Oh, yep. Oh, God, they're running this time. They're running. sort of diagonally because it's actually faster to run diagonally than it is to run straight. I'm sorry if it looks weird, but it's faster. I've had to run around this town a lot. I'm experienced in running. safe though? <laughs> nope, looks like I'm not safe. Wow, Matthew, you really managed to lock everything, huh? Um... Oh fuck, I just saw him. There's a back entrance. Okay. I, uh, fuck. I don't know where to go. Sophia? Sophia! Up, up, up. To the roof. I think it maybe went the wrong way. I don't think any of those items are gonna help. Fuck. Oh shit, okay. I can't close it. <laughs> I was trying to see if I can close it behind me. Okay, so maybe I was supposed to go on this floor? I'm just looking for Sophia again. Oh, Christ. 
Where did you go, Sophia? Oh! Oh, there we go. Sophia, I can't think of a way out of here. I'm just gonna keep diagonal running. Oh! Huh. <laughs> I myself for a second, I was wondering what they were doing. I can't go out that way. Ah. Uh... I can go back to the basement. I keep seeing you here, Sophia. Where do you want me to go? fucking heart attack. I don't understand. Yeah, Sophia keeps appearing right there, right there, again and again. It looks like stairs. I went up to the top floor, that doesn't seem to be it. So then this floor? What on this floor? I know this is a dead end, there's no point in going that way. Sophia, help me! <gasps> what? Okay, I'll go to the roof again. Like, I feel like that should be the solution, but I didn't see anything. Wait, do I need to, like, push the killer? Oh. Oh! Do I need to lure him over? Or something? I feel like Sophia's gonna like push him or something. What do I do there? Also, the chalk outline. <sighs> to Janet. I'm glad that you made it back safely and uncovered the truth about the Paines Creek killings. Good job. Your story will be on the front page of tomorrow's newspaper. Please submit the following information as well as a photo for your article as soon as possible. There's still those couple of letters I didn't get to read. I should have read the letters before listening to the audio thing. I didn't think that Matthew would try to kill me. By the way, we found out who hired P.I. Stephen Moss. Okay, well, I was planning on going through all my notes and stuff to, you know, do all this. But um, it feels like there's not really much need. I think I know everything I need to know now. Who killed Vivian Roberts? Well... <laughs> Matthew Brooks. What was the murder weapon? Axe. Select a photo for your newspaper article. Okay. Here's what I'm thinking. You know, finding out the killer and all that is pretty cool. Like, that's pretty important reporting. But do you know what's even more important than that? Ghosts are real. 
it's just occurred to me while doing this case. <laughs> it occurred to me pretty early on when I realized ghosts are real that the much more interesting story, the more like wide ranging and important story to tell here is not the whole case of the murder, which is important and everything, or the murders, many murders, but ghosts are real. That's earth shattering news. Like, shouldn't that be the front page? Can't think of anything else that'd be a better fit. I mean, like a bloody murder weapon could do. You know, something like this. Trisha, Scott, and Derek all pulled apart. A family photo could do. An old picture of Sophia would certainly do. That'd probably be the most appropriate thing. But I prefer ghosts are real. Killer's name, Matthew Brooks, murder weapon, axe, article, photo, ghosts are real. <laughs> so, yeah, let's just, let's just stop for a second here. Let's just try to pull everything together. I mean, we know all about Matthew and how we heard him confess to killing Dr. Henry Johnson, to killing Vivian, to killing Steve Moss, and to trying to kill me. But, who killed Scott? So, I'm like 99% sure that it was Bernard, based on what we heard. It was either Derek or Bernard. It was looking like Derek at first, because of the fact that we know that Derek and Scott had an argument in the marketplace the day before he was killed, and we, found, and we know that Scott died from stab wounds, and we found Derek's pocket knife. So that made me think Derek, but it's almost certainly Bernard. We know that Bernard was with Charles when Charles was drinking and drunk and mentioning that he wishes Scott was dead. And I guess at the time, Bernard still loved Vivian. So thinking that Scott was the killer, he was like, sure, I'll go kill him. And he did. He definitely did. I mean, there's a bloody knife under a bloody floorboard in his house. And Scott was killed by stabbing. By being stabbed to death. It was definitely Bernard. So, who killed Sophia? Vivian. Andrew and Dr. Johnson were there. Derek was watching through a keyhole when he was five years old. But it was Sophia that actually killed her. Sounds like probably accidentally, but still ended up killing her in a fit of rage or whatever. And Andrew hid the body. And yeah, just to repeat what I said before, I guess, Matthew killed Vivian and P.I. Stephen Moss and Andrew and Dr. Johnson. It's interesting, though, just one little strange thing that I don't quite understand is Matthew admitted to killing Andrew, right? In the tape? But it said Andrew died from from stabs that were small, from like a pocket knife or something. We didn't find any sort of a pocket knife like murder weapon that was bloody or anything like that. Of course, uh, there's no reason Matthew couldn't have gotten his hands on something like that, but given that he admitted to it, I, I guess he did kill Andrew. I, I guess that's it. Just to go over to my notes for a second, there's a lot of to-dos, but I guess most of them are pretty irrelevant now. Find the drain, find the key, done. The light that takes the key in Matthew's office, done. The E in the killer's letter, that was with Matthew. The key for Oliver's photo lab, done. Oh yeah, this whole thing, by the way, I forgot to mention it. Stephen Moss's diary mentioned that Matthew played a game of Sophia about favorite places, secret messages, find them all to lead you to your prize, and I was thinking that it was probably leading me to the red box. It was. I forgot to show you, but I looked at a couple more of the messages, and they were like, stream, bird, 
um, stuff like that. It was definitely leading you to the red box. So that's done with. Tool to open stuck drawer in upper floor one. house done. Time capsule done. Trisha's room in the hospital done. Stephen Moss's briefcase done. Oh, that's really old. This one's the some sort of the the key for the basement thing in the cabin. Bloody board need hammer to pull the nails done. Safe pine painting and mansion done. Desk drawer in Father Matthew's room, done. Sheriff's cabinet code, done. All our to-dos, done. Except I guess this one I never quite looked up on. I couldn't quite figure out what the employer document was in the hospital that I that I apparently missed. That was from a viewer. Not sure what that was, but I guess it probably wasn't important if it was anything. And I've got all these notes, but I think we know what happened. I was expecting to have to pull everything together, but I really pretty much didn't. <laughs> it kind of just did it for me right at the end. Okay. Submit. To Dorothy Patterson, my name is Janet Kelly. I'm here to inform you on behalf of P.I. Steve Moss that the secrets of the Paines Creek killings have come to light. He is, however, missing. The police are searching for his whereabouts. While preparing for this letter, I could not help but wonder, what if Charles didn't commit adultery? What if Vivian had not confronted Sophia? What if Magdalene hadn't insisted on a son to continue the family line? Could things have turned out differently? In hindsight, it's easy to say what they should not have done. Sometimes it's hard to make the right choices in life, isn't it? Did Derek really hate Scott so much that it led to his death? Could Matthew not have sought revenge for Sophia? And why did Henry Johnson choose to be an accomplice in Magdalene's death? The truth was that everyone made a choice they think was the best, but not necessarily the right one. This made me realize the following. We have the freedom to say or do whatever we want, but there are consequences following our actions. The bigger the mistake, the harsher the consequence. It was true that Charles and Sophia's affair was wrong, but Vivian had a choice. Either, either to confront Charles about it, or take it out on Sophia. She chose the latter. Just as Vivian made her choice, so did Andrew, Henry, and Matthew. In the end, they all had to face the consequences. One thing puzzled me. If Steve and I were both trying to find out the truth, why was I saved but not him? I hope I can find an answer someday. Till then, this is the story of the Paines Creek killings. <laughs> There's a picture of a ghost on the front page. <laughs> So yeah, just to uh, tie up a couple loose threads, so I can be pretty sure, although I don't think it's stated explicitly, that because of Henry Johnson's um, misappropriation, aka stealing, of the Roberts Foundation funds that Vivian found out about, hired an investigator, found out about it, had proof of it, even contacted Henry Johnson about it, um, I think it's safe to say that that's how he got caught up in the whole thing with Vivian and became an accomplice to what happened with Sophia and you know, helped to poison Magdalene. It's because he was probably blackmailed by Vivian. Grade A, 93% complete. Nice. What is the 7%? <laughs> what is the 7%? What is it? So, like, can you continue? If you continue, it'll probably continue, because it, it said no saves allowed after Matthew started coming, so it was probably from right before then, when you first entered the church, I'm guessing? If so, that's going to give us an opportunity to read those letters. I want to read them. I took pictures of them just before I ran out of the place, but no opportunity. Let's see. Yeah, it's from when I just entered. Okay. Alright, let's see. Let's not play the tape this time. This is from Calvin Bennett, November 1st, 1984. Dearest Matthew, I'm writing this letter to let you know what happened to Sophia. My days are almost up, and I feel you have the right to know what happened nine years ago. In 1975, when Vivian Roberts underwent a C-section to deliver Tricia, she was told that she could not give birth anymore. Vivian broke down mentally and was hospitalized. Sophia was assigned to take care of Tricia, her newborn baby, and Charles, her husband. 
Charles, who was facing a lot of difficulty and pressure, unfortunately found comfort in Sophia. They had an affair. A boy was born. A few months later, Vivian found out about the affair. She was furious. Feeling threatened by the illegitimate boy, Vivian kicked Sophia and the baby out of Payne's Creek. Everyone believed that. But the truth is, I took the boy and put him in St. Patrick's Orphanage. I named him Scott. Time flies. He's going to be ten soon. I pray that you can bear the responsibility of raising him. He does not need to know about his real parents. It's all in the past. Instead, just give him a new start. I sincerely hope that you can forgive me for hiding this from you for so long. Is this just one letter? Yeah, it's just one letter. From Sophia Miller, April 12th, 1975. Dear Matthew, It's been more than two years since I started work at the mansion. I like this place a lot. The people here are nice to me. I thank you for your letter. Although I cannot be there with you for your missionary work, I will pray for your success. Wait, haven't I read this? Or maybe not. Um, you were always the noble one. Do you remember the wishes we made when we were at the orphanage? Yours was to help the unfortunate. Mine's not to be poor anymore. Well, I did not expect opportunity to knock so soon. Maybe heaven is helping me? With all that has happened these past few months, my wish might just come true. I'd love to tell you more about it, but it can wait until you're back. Things might be different by then. I hope it will be for the better. Love always, Sophia. Hope it will be for the better. Alright, well that has been the Payne's Creek Killings. I am curious why I only got 93%. I wonder if what I wonder if your choice of picture actually matters? Does it affect anything? Could it have affected that number? I don't know. I definitely don't feel bad about choosing a picture of a literal ghost. Photographic evidence of a ghost for the front page of the article. Anyway, yeah, that's been the Paints Killings. That was a extraordinary game. I loved it. I mean, it's certainly very rough around the edges. I mean, it performs really poorly. It can look kind of janky at times. It controls weirdly, etc., etc. A huge amount of grammar and spelling issues and things like that. But I've never played anything quite like it. It was so engaging. I loved it. Going through a almost empty town, <laughs> aside from Sophia and Matthew, and just looking at all these old relics and the past and putting a case together, only for the whole thing to be brought forward to, hey, this is actually still relevant now because Matthew is here in town. With an axe. Another axe. Where does Matthew keep getting these axes? Did he steal it from Bernard? The original one? And then did he go back and steal another one to try to kill me or what? Dunno. But yeah, I, I think this was a fantastic game. Rough, but unique and fascinating and just fantastic well i hope you enjoyed watching me play through the pains creek killings thanks for joining me